Well, good morning, everyone. And as you can see, we are going to have a bit of a different start today. That is my cat. That is my cat sitting on my notes in front of my computer screen. And I'm sure now that we're all um, have been inside for a bit, we've all had our share of uh, mishaps, miscues, and challenges. And I had a big one thanks to my cat, so I thought I'd share it with you. This is actually take two of this video. Take one, I was just about done with when my cat decides to jump on the keyboard, scramble my slides, headbutt me, and then sit on my script. Now, you think, no problem, just edit it out. Well, if you think that, you'd be wrong, because trying to edit in this program, not easy. I either went back too far or not far enough, and it was all choppy and pretty much a mess. So anyway, I had to get rid of that whole uh, video and start anew. So we are at take two, and um, because of that, my cat gets uh, top billing in this one. All right, let's talk about what we have coming up, but first, I don't want you to get the wrong impression about the cat. Generally speaking, my cat's a good cat. Usually when I'm making these videos, she's right next to me, in my letter tray, like it shows right there, asleep. So for the most part, she's good, but sometimes it's a problem. All right, enough about my pet issues. We'll move forward here. Let's see, what do we have coming up? Chapter 10 quiz this Friday at midnight. Everyone seems to be keeping up with the quizzes pretty well. So uh, well done. Keep up the good work there. And then this Wednesday at midnight is the next section of your business plan, marketing strategy. So hopefully you're all talking to each other about that and ready to get that in. All right. With that, let's move forward to Chapter 10 here. All right. And uh, this chapter is on product design and development, and it's a relatively short chapter. Uh, therefore, this is going to be a relatively short video. And um, keep in mind, if you're following along in the book, that I did move two sections from Chapter 9 into this chapter. Product Lifecycle, which we'll talk about today, and Consumer Behavior, which we'll get to on Wednesday. And with that, we'll go into our learning objectives. And today, we're going to cover this, um, these over on the left-hand side here. And then on Wednesday, we'll get to the sections over here on the right. And with that, as you know, we like to start our chapters with a question. So the question on this chapter is, what's it mean? And we're going to continue with the, uh, the cat theme here. But Ralph Waldo Emerson had a quote, and it was, Build a better mousetrap, and the world will be the path to your door. You may have heard of it. What do you think that means? Well, essentially, he's talking about the power of innovation and differentiation. If you can build something better than your competitors, a better product, a better value, that's going to lead customers to come and find you. And that's what this chapter is about. Product design and product development. Determining on what your customers need and then moving backwards and designing something that they will buy. There's another famous quote I want to bring up here because it's similar to this one. And the quote is this. Everything that can be invented has been invented. Everything that can be invented has been invented. Now, who do you think said that and when? <clears throat> well, it was said by a guy named Charles Duell, who was the commissioner of the U.S. Patent Office. And they're the ones that give out patents for new ideas and new uh, inventions. And when did he say this? He said it back in 1889. And the reason I bring that up is, don't think just because where we are today, we have so many great things and great new technology that, you know what, it's going to be real hard to come up with something. There's always opportunity to invent new things. And this guy thought back in 1889 
we've got everything that could be invented has been invented. So I want to show you a few things that we still use today that existed back in 1889. And let's just take a look at them. Okay, the evolution of eight objects Americans use every day. So let's go and take a look at things like cars. All right, so back in Charles Duell's days, this is what he had. Everything that could be invented has been invented. But obviously, look, over the years, right? A little different today, and that doesn't look that new compared to his day. Home audio systems, same thing. Oh, can't get any better than that, right? But then, through the years, it keeps changing. I remember that, taking it to the playground when I was uh, more or less your age. And now we're at smart speakers. TVs, same thing. Vacuum cleaners, all right. Don't look if they've changed very much till recently. Fans. Telephone, goes without saying. Headphones, same thing. I remember having those things. Sneakers. So again, don't think that just because everything is modern and new that you don't have a chance to improve and innovate and design. Obviously, you do. Okay, let's move on. Product development. Okay, so let's start with this. There's four main product development categories I wanted to talk about. And to help kind of understand them, I'm going to use the example of fast food when going over them. So product development number one is the new to the company. New to the company. And this is something that competitors may have had, but you didn't. So it's new to your company. And an example of this is McDonald's All Day Breakfast. They just went to that in October of 2015. Before that, you could get All Day Breakfast at other places, but not at McDonald's. So that was a new to the company product development for McDonald's. And it's obviously worked out very well for them. Their stock went up pretty much right after that was um, introduced, and they still have it today. Number two, improvement of an existing product. So this is something that you did have, but you made it better. You enhanced it and make it better. And a good example of that is Popeye's chicken sandwich. I'm sure you all heard about, you know, back in the summer of uh, 2019, Popeye's introduced that new chicken sandwich. Everybody loved it. There's lines out the door at Popeye's. Well, that replaced a, a chicken po' boy that Popeye's used to have. Obviously it wasn't near as popular but they came up with an improvement of an existing product and it really worked out very well for them. Third is an extension of a product line. And for this, you can use the example of McDonald's McCafe. McDonald's always had coffee. They had shakes, but then they went to an extension of a product line, which is something it's new, but it's really a variation of an existing product a variation of an existing product. So they had coffee, they had shakes, and then they extended it. So with their McCafe line, they had mocha and cappuccino and fraps and smoothies. So that's a third product development category, extension of product line. And then the fourth and final one is new to the market. Now this means that no comparable product really existed. And for this, I'm going to use a different example, that of ride sharing. Because when ride sharing came out, there really wasn't anything like that prior to it coming out. And down here on the bottom left of this uh, slide where it says sidecar, how many of you have heard of sidecar? Well, sidecar was really the pioneer of ride sharing. It was founded in San Francisco in 2011 and it doesn't exist anymore. Obviously, you've heard of Uber and Lyft. They're the two big ride-sharing companies. So why didn't Sidecar make, even though they, they were first to the market? 
Well, it was really two reasons, uh, largely. One is their technology wasn't as good as Uber and Lyft. It was complicated. You had to enter your destination. You had to look up where drivers were, compare prices. So it was a bit of a nightmare. Nowhere near as easy as Uber and Lyft. But the real reason was the ability to raise money. Sidecar was only able to raise about $37 million. In comparison, Lyft raised a billion dollars, Uber raised $8 billion. And because Uber and Lyft raised so much more, they were able to get all much better technology. They had much, many more drivers out there, so the drivers were readily available. And people therefore went to Uber and Lyft and away from Sidecar, and um, Sidecar uh, went away in 2015. So, four different product development categories. Product development process. Let's take a look at this. Really, it's a seven-step process. And I'm going to give you a second just to look through those seven steps. And not all steps have to be followed, but just as kind of a typical process for new products. And really what I wanted to talk about here is there's challenges when you try to introduce a new product. First of all, there's a lot of risk, because most new products don't make it. But there's also challenges. And the first of these are trade-offs. Trade-offs. And a trade-off is when you get more of one thing, that means you get less of another. And with this coronavirus um, pandemic we're living under, it's really a good example. And that is, when do we open up the economy again? because there's trade-offs there. If you open it up too early, hey, the economy gets back on track earlier, people get back to work earlier, but it could lead to more um, cases of coronavirus. If you wait too long, you could have fewer cases of coronavirus, but the economy is gonna be hurt and people might not have jobs to go back to. So there's trade-offs, there's trade-offs. Really there's trade-offs with anything in politics or in general. Just consider the, the speed limit. We could have a national or a state speed limit of 30 miles an hour. You could have that no problem. Would that lead to fewer traffic deaths? Almost certainly. If you couldn't drive more than 30, there'd be a lot fewer traffic deaths. So why don't we do it? Because people don't want that. They're willing to say, you know what, we understand there'll be more traffic deaths, but that's worth it because we're able to get places a lot faster. And so the speed limit is 55 or 65 or 70. People understand that it's more risk, but there's a balance there. There's trade-offs. They're willing to live with one to give up another. So the same thing in the product development process, trade-offs. Secondly, time pressure. Time is money, right? I mean, you're rarely going to have perfect information, but you have to make decision because the longer it takes to produce something, the more money you're spending. Something to keep in mind. And then finally, economics. And by that I'm really referring to opportunity cost. Because every dollar you put into developing a new product, every person you dedicate to that effort, every resource that you dedicate that effort, is a dollar, a person, or a resource you're not dedicating to something else. So, something to think about. It's not just the stuff you're dedicating there, it's what you're not dedicating it to that you have to consider. So, product development process. Okay, so let's start talking about an important theory, and I'm going to show you a video in a second on diffusion of innovations. Diffusion means to spread. Okay, so diffusion of innovations is how innovations are spread and adopted by people over time. And this is a very famous theory developed by a guy named Everett Rogers in 1962. And he said, when new ideas and technology come into being, they're adopted in essentially a bell curve. That people can be broken into five distinct groups. And I'm going to go through these groups and think about which one you might be in and which one's different friends you have might be in. Because this is how technologies are 
adapted or spread over time according to this theory. So the first group are what are called innovators. Only two and a half percent of the population. Very few. Generally young people, definitely risk takers, generally technologically savvy, very entrepreneurial. These are the people that will try anything. Anything comes down the pike and it's new, they're the first that are going to try it. Do you know people like that? Relatively few. After that, it's what's called early adopters, 13.5% of the population. Again, these are people who are generally young, have some money, they're very social, and they're known as thought leaders or trendsetters. So when these people adapt something, they really have a tendency to influence other people. But because they like that position of being trendsetters, they need to be judicious in their selection. They just don't try anything. And then the majority of the U.S. population falls into early majority or late majority. Two-thirds of the population is here. Early majority, pragmatic people. They like to see proof before they adapt something. They'll generally have contact with early adopters. And then late majority, more cautious, more risk averse. They need proof. They don't just like proof. They need proof. Generally, people who are a little bit older fall into that category. And then finally, laggards. Again, probably the oldest uh, component here. Very skeptical. They dislike change. They typically will only adapt something if there's no other choice. Diffusion of innovations theory. A really widely accepted theory about how new ideas and technology take root. So with that, I'm going to show you a short video, it's only three and a half minutes, that talks a little bit about that. Have you ever noticed that some people adopt new products or behavior sooner than others? In 1962, Everett Rogers, a professor of rural psychology, developed a theory called the diffusion of innovations to explain this phenomenon. Rogers found that individuals within any society fall into one of five different adopter groups based on how early or how quickly they adopt an innovation. Rogers' theory tells us that if you want to promote the widespread adoption of a new behavior like these, you need to market to each adopter group differently using distinct communication channels and messages. Let's look at each group to find out more. The innovators are a small but important group because they are always the first to learn about and adopt an innovation. They are risk-taking, adventurous, and like being on the cutting edge. The innovators are responsible for introducing innovations to the larger population because they share their experiences with their friends and communities. The early adopters are also a small forward-thinking group and are often highly respected as opinion leaders. Their endorsement of an innovation plays a key role in what we call crossing the chasm, which is when the adoption of an innovation bridges the gap between the trendsetters and the majority. About two-thirds of people in a population fall into either the early or late majority groups. The early majority take time to make decisions. They will observe others' experiences and will only adopt a product once they are convinced it has real benefits and that it is the new status quo. The late majority are more resistant to change, but they are very responsive to peer pressure. They want innovations to be very well tested and widely used before they will risk trying it. Finally, the last group to adopt a new product or innovation is called the laggards. Laggards are highly resistant to change, and they also can be hard to reach with marketing campaigns because they often have very minimal exposure to media. Laggards wait until an innovation is completely mainstream before they adopt it, and in some cases, they never do. Think 
of some global innovations in recent years. Social media, for example, spread very fast and many people adopted it within a few years. Other innovations, such as the use of solar power, spread much more slowly and may take decades to reach widespread adoption. So the next time you're promoting a new product or behavior, consider the theory of diffusions of innovations and tailor your communication channels and messages. This will improve your chance of catalyzing widespread adoption. So a pretty good, um, a pretty good video there. Um, and again, kind of the point is you're going to market to each group differently. So it's important to understand this theory of how it's, how technology and new ideas are likely to be adopted, and therefore knowing which group is in play at a certain time and how to um, adapt your marketing and promotion accordingly. Okay, so our products now have been um, adopted. Now let's take a look at what's called a product life cycle because most products tend to have just that, a life cycle, pretty much just like people. And there's four stages in a product life cycle. Introduction, when it first comes out. Then the growth stage, when it really starts to pick up pace. Maturity, and then ultimately, it declines. And this cycle can be centuries, decades, years, or months, depending on the product. You've heard of uh, Brooks Brothers Suits? You know when they got their start? 1818. Over 200 years ago. So that product life cycle is over 200 years. And right now they're likely in the maturity or maybe just beginning the decline phase. Something like Cheerios or Wheaties. They've been around 50, 60, 70, 80 years, something like that. So decades as opposed to centuries. Think of something like VCRs or DVDs. Their life cycle lasted years, just years, not decades. And then think of something like something you all probably did a couple years ago. Remember? Pokemon Go? Remember that? Yeah, the summer of 2016, I bet some of you were doing that. Well, by the fall of 2016, that had pretty much gone away. So that product life cycle could be measured in months. So let's just take a look briefly at each of those stages. So in the introductory stage, the introduction stage, that's when you're just informing the market, educating the market about your product. There's hardly any competition there, and you'll generally have losses because you're spending money to promote the product, to train people, establish sales channels. There's relatively few sales at that stage. Then you move into the growth stage. People are starting to become aware of it. Costs are starting to go down. Sales are starting to go up. Now you're starting to see profits. Profits begin, and then they peak at the late part of the growth stage. You might just start you might start seeing competitors appear at this point because they see, hmm, we have this new product and it's doing well. Then the maturity phase. This is where sales reach saturation. It gets hard to really expand further because pretty much everyone that needs this product has it. And the only sales are if they're just replacing what they already have or new people are coming along to buy it, the maturity stage. And then finally, decline. That's where the market overall starts going down. Sales go down, profits go down, and if necessary, the product just dies if it becomes unprofitable. So let's take a look at some things that are in each stage. Introduction stage. What do you think is in the introduction stage right now? Well, things like self-driving cars, AI, artificial intelligence, wearable medical technology, just kind of being introduced. How about the growth stage? What do you think is in the growth stage right now? Well, you could say things like electric cars, smart speakers, 
really ride sharing all in the growth stage. How about maturity? Things like laptops, flat screens, microwaves, all in the maturity stage. So that brings us to decline. What do you think's there? Things like PCs, GPS trackers, the home telephone, cereals like Cheerios that we brought up before, all in the decline stage. So product life cycle, like diffusion of innovations, important concept to grasp as marketers. So I'm going to show you a short video of this too, just two minutes, that talks a little bit more about the product life cycle. Take a look at all the stuff around you. Your cell phone, that leftover delivery pizza on your table, the TV mounted nicely on the wall. At one time, none of these products even existed. They were introduced to fill a perceived gap in the marketplace. Some things, like your smartphone, are constantly being reinvented to meet consumers' ever-changing needs. While others, like that old VCR you're now using as a planter, enjoyed a long, lucrative life before it became obsolete. In a way, products are a lot like people. They are born, grow, mature, and eventually die. Some goods quickly go through all four stages, while others may stay in the maturity phase for a century or more. When flat-screen TVs were introduced in the marketplace, consumers suddenly had the option of owning a sleek appliance that gave viewers a widescreen cinema-like experience to watch their favorite shows. At first, profits were negative because so much money was spent launching the product. But during the growth stage, sales increased at a rapid rate as more and more consumers realized the benefits of owning a flat screen TV. Profits will also peak during this stage, but new competitors enter the market. Soon, it seems like everybody, including your grandma, has a flat screen in their home. Sales hit their peak but profits decline as marketing costs go up. It is at this point that the TV maker may decide to phase out the product and let new models take its place. Like flat screens with 3D capability, internet ready TVs, and even eco-friendly HD models. It's all part of the circle, or rather, cycle, of a product's life. So, again, I think they um, a pretty good video. And why is the product life cycle particularly important? Well, for one reason, how you advertise and promote the, your product is going to depend on where it is in that life cycle. The type of advertising you use is going to be dependent on that. For example, initially, when you're in the introductory phase, you'll use something called informative advertising. You're just trying to build initial demand and to tell people about it. Using that ride-sharing example, you'd be saying, here's how this thing works. Here's why you need it. Here's what it is. You're informing people. And then, as you move into the growth stage and the early maturity stage, now you're looking at persuasive advertising trying to improve the competitive status of your product. So now you're saying, okay, you've heard of us, you've heard of our industry ride sharing, here's why we're better than taking a cab, here's why we're better than using your own car, here's why we're better than taking public transportation. You're trying to persuade people at that point to use you. <clears throat> Excuse me. Next, there's comparative advertising. Now you're moving into the maturity stage or even into the early decline stage. Now you want to contrast your product with other competitors. If you're Uber, you're saying, we're Uber, here's why you should use us, not Lyft. You're comparing your service to somebody else's because people are well aware of the product now and you want them to use yours, not somebody else's. And then finally, reminder-oriented advertising. That comes into play in late maturity or decline stages. 
It's for some products that people know all about it, but you want to keep it top of their mind so they don't forget about you. And a perfect example of this is McDonald's. McDonald's. Let me ask you a question. How many people have heard of McDonald's? Dumb question, right? Everybody's heard of McDonald's. Well, do you know how much they spent on advertising in 2019? By one study, about $450 million. Well, if you've heard of McDonald's, and everybody you know has heard of McDonald's, why did they spend $450 million on advertising last year? Well, it's largely reminder-oriented advertising. Some comparative, but mostly reminder-oriented. Why? One, they want McDonald's to remain top of mind. They want you to think, if someone were to ask you, name a fast food restaurant, how many of you would immediately say McDonald's? Probably most of you. They want that. They want McDonald's to be top of mind for you. Secondly, just to educate you, there's always new menu items. There's always new promotions. There's always new consumers, people that are young and growing up. So there's educational reasons to keep doing it. Three, the power of suggestion. They might advertise breakfast during the morning drive time, and you're thinking, boy, I would like a coffee, or I would like a Egg McMuffin. So power of suggestion. There's also defensive reasons. McDonald's thinks, you know what, if we don't do it, well, Wendy's could, or Mc uh, Burger King could, and we want to stay top of mind, so we want to do it. And so it's really just a long-term strategy. If McDonald's stopped advertising tomorrow, would it affect them in the next week, two weeks, month? Probably not very much. But long-term, in a year, two years, three years? Yeah, probably would. That's why they do it. Reminder-oriented advertising. Other implications of the product life cycle. Well, you want to try to extend it, <clears throat> excuse me, as long as your product is, one, profitable. Obviously, if it's not profitable, there's no sense having the product. And two, if it doesn't negatively impact EPS, which is your earnings per share. Now, what does that even mean? doesn't negatively impact earnings per share. Well, let me give you an example of what I mean by that. Let's say you're a company and you have three different products, and they're all re uh, returning about a 10% profit margin. So you're making 10% on each of those three products. Well, if you had a fourth product and you were only getting a 1% return, does it really make sense to have that product? because it's bringing your overall product margin down. It might, but it also might not. It's something you really have to think through as managers and owners of a business. What questions would you ask if you had one product that had such a low profit margin? Why is it so low? Is this a dying business? Are my costs too high? Should I just sell this business, take any money I get, and reinvest it into my good stuff? where I'm getting 10%. Hmm, but do I have customers that are buying my, my good products, my 10% ones, because they use the 1% one? Have to give that some consideration. And then there's opportunity cost again. Boy, if I'm only making 1% of this, what if I just close it up and take all the money I was spending on this thing that was only turning 1%? Heck, I could buy stocks and bonds with that money and make more than 1%. So, Lots of things you have to think through if, you're, if you have a product, even if it's profitable, if it's not really helping your overall earnings. But if you have determined that that product is something you want to move forward with, how do you extend the product life cycle as it shows in that graphic there? If you want to extend it, what strategies can you use to do that? Well, there's a few. You can try to add new users. Okay, how would you do that? Well, you could ex ask existing clients for uh, referrals or give them rewards for referrals. You could change your promotional mix. Maybe you weren't using sponsorships and you try that. Try to form a strategic alliance with a different group. Different strategies to try to add new users. You could try to increase the frequency of use. 
you might start a loyalty reward program make special offers or limited time coupons or sales to try to get existing users to use your product more than they are you could try to find new uses for the product the mcdonald's all day um, breakfast example okay that was a new use they had breakfast but now they had it all day reese's peanut butter cups boy talk about a perfect example of new uses for a product when that was first introduced it was a reese's peanut butter cup do you know how many different sizes and types reese's comes in now you got a two pack you got a four pack you got an eight pack you have reese's pieces you've got the many uh reese's easter you've got reese's uh, bunnies valentine's day you have hearts over the holidays you have santa claus right you can have reese's puffs cereal reese's and ice cream you can find reese's in everything i mean they've done a great job of finding all sorts of new uses for that product and then finally you can alter the product designs or packagings or logos you know think of backpacks it seems like every school year there's a different design this one's lightweight or this one has pockets that are perfect for your laptop or your phone and now it has a charger just continually updating designs packaging logos think of sports teams soccer teams in particular every year it seems like they come up with a new away jersey um, why do they do that why is it orange one year and light blue another year and green another year well you can sell more product if it's new and different every year and so teams are continually updating designs and logos and it's not just teams products are continually updating their logos you might not even realize it but let me show you a few logos that have been um, updated over the years and let's start with ones you know pepsi look how that logo started right well over 100 years ago and has evolved over time and then you can make fun of uh, logos coke apple look what apple's first logo nike doesn't even use um the word nike anymore on their logo So lots of logos that get continually updated. Something for you to think about as well. Okay, this is our final uh, topic for the, uh, for the day. Told you it was going to be a relatively short video. It's a relatively short chapter. And this is about identifying business opportunities. Um, most new products fail. I mentioned that at the beginning. According to one Harvard uh, study in 2017, about 80% of products fail. That's a big number. So let's take a look at this graphic. What we should do to identify a business opportunity, which is, some, which is an idea that has an opportunity to make money, to actually make sales. Well, ask yourself three questions. Question number one, who would my customers be? Target market. Okay, target market. Who would my customers be? Question number two, why will they buy the product from me? Differentiation. Why us? We talked about both of those things. Target market, differentiation, the first two things. And then third, how will customers benefit from my product? value proposition how we started today's lesson with the build a better mousetrap if you build a better product at a better value so you have a good value proposition then you'll tend to get customers coming to your product so target market differentiation value proposition to help you identify good business opportunities obviously it's not easy that's why 80% of products each year, give or take, fail. But even the most successful companies in the world have had big-time failures. And if you don't believe me, well, take a look at this.
recognize some of those? Let me just quickly go through them. You guys see me drink water every day when I was in class. You probably never saw me with a Coors water. There's a reason for that. It didn't last. Everybody knew Coors for beer. They tried water, and nobody used Coors water. Amazon. Anybody have an Amazon phone? Well, I'm assuming no, because when Amazon tried to come out with something called the Fire Phone, it was a disaster. It couldn't beat Apple or Android, and even when they tried to sell it for 99 cents, it didn't work. They lost about $170 million trying to bring that out. That, you see where it says peak there? That was a device from Twitter. All it did was send and receive tweets. And actually did it pretty badly, because it only gave about a 20-character preview of your tweets. What do you think of that? But they actually came up with this thing. Google Glass, right? Nobody really so much of a use to have your screen on your glass. New Coke was a famous one when Coke changed the recipe of Coke, and nobody liked it. You've all heard of Harley-Davidson, right? Motorcycles. How about Harley-Davidson perfume? Yep. Harley-Davidson at one point thought it would be a good idea to come out with a perfume. Apple, yep, even big companies, right? Amazon, Google, Apple make mistakes. And this was called their Newton, and it was a PDA, a personal digital assistant, that came out. And this was back in 1993. And if you think autocorrect is bad now, what do you think it was like in 1993? Awful. So anytime anybody wrote something, it would autocorrect to something nowhere near what they needed. And then finally, McDonald's. Okay, we talked about them today too. Probably their biggest product failure was something called the Arch Deluxe. And what they did with the Arch Deluxe was they marketed it to adults only. McDonald's came up with a burger that they said kids do not like the taste of this thing. And that's how they marketed it. Brand failure. Arch Deluxe. The burger with a grown-up taste. Marketed as a burger with a grown-up taste. The trouble was, as this says, people don't go to McDonald's for that, for sophistication. They want convenience. They want something that they're used to. And to market this as something that kids don't like, well, it was a complete disaster. So again, even big companies that we saw here, really the biggest, Coke, McDonald's, Apple, Google, Amazon, have had disasters. Now, let's think, are there any products that have been recently introduced that you think could join this slide in the future, or the near future? Can you think of anything? I've got one. It was just introduced a couple of months ago, and they had a big rollout. And you've all heard of it, and the rollout didn't go very well. Do you know what I'm referring to? Well, last video of the day, I'm going to show you. So I present to you the Cybertruck. Despite a bold rollout complete with smoke and lights, the Tesla Cybertruck is off to a bumpy start. The electric pickup truck billed as an alternative to traditional pickup models. Doesn't look like anything else. But after touting the truck's tough stainless steel exterior, able to withstand a sledgehammer, the demo then moved on to showcase what are supposed to be shatterproof windows. But against this metal ball? Oh my God. Well, maybe that was a little too hard. Not quite. And on the second try, <laughs> not any better. It didn't go through. Afterward, co-founder and CEO Elon Musk tweeted, during practice, it didn't even scratch the glass, even posting video as proof, noting they have some improvements to make before production. Still, Tesla stock took a hit of its own, down 6% on Friday. Reactions were mixed, some hailing the new model as the future, others slamming everything from the demo to the design, with one comparing it to a kindergarten drawing. I kind of view it as a disaster in terms of other launch events, in terms of what we saw with the crack glass. In terms of the truck, it's the wow factor, the Mad Max, Blade Runner type thing. We've seen electric car demos short out before. Earlier this year, Infiniti rolled out its Model QX Inspiration, a precursor to its first fully electric SUV. But during the demo, the car did not drive on stage as planned. You can't see it, but it is here. As for Musk, he kept the show rolling, 
despite the unexpected detour. So we're going to be offering rides in this all night. So what do you think? Mortifying, right? In front of all those people and both of the glasses shatter when they're not supposed to. So who knows? Uh, next year, in the next couple of years, will we see a picture of that uh, truck on this slide? You know, time will tell. Time will tell. Well, that is, um, that's it for today. That's the first half of uh, chapter 10. As I said, it's a relatively short chapter. So on Wednesday, we will send you the second half of the chapter. Don't forget the, um, the marketing section of your business plans are due uh, Wednesday. And so with that, i got to go feed my cat. Okay, She's crawling up on me here. You're going to hear her in a second. And uh, everybody stay safe, take care, and we'll be in touch on Wednesday.